to get right down to the nitty gritty of things, to the, uh, the, the history of the church. But in order to talk about its history, we have to know that there is a church. And so we're going to talk about things that, uh, that, that are mentioned as far as prophecy is concerned, as far as the, the establishment of the church. We're going to talk about its establishment and how important it is to us. You know, I think sometimes we lose sight of how precious this organization is and how wonderful and how blessed we are to be able to be a part of it. I don't know if you realize it, but there were hundreds, thousands, millions of people that never had the opportunity that you had. In other words, before Christ, there was this wanting, there was this desire that people had for a, a, a way of salvation. Their sins could not be forgiven completely. They were just simply rolled ahead year after year after year because there was nothing precious enough. There was nothing that uh, was sufficient enough to take away the sins of man. And so we, we, we realize that, that today we are blessed because Jesus came, because he died on the cross. And I want to emphasize to you that this church, which you and I are a part of, and most of us here tonight anyway, the Church of Christ, which we are a part of, is one of the most glorious institutions in the world. I think it's the greatest institution in the world. There are great institutions of, of medicine, you know, that help people to be able to live. There are institutions of money that help people to be able to, you know, borrow money and so forth and use it for their businesses and build up their lifestyle and things of that nature. There are government agencies, of course, that rule the world and control the world, but there's nothing that can compare to the church, which is the body of Christ, wherein is salvation, because the Bible says there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. And so the church... Is, is that important to us? In fact, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, the Ephesian letter, he was talking about, uh, well, man and woman. He was talking about the woman and the, the, the love that a man should have for his wife. He's talking about the obedience that the woman should have for her husband and all of those things being in submission to one another. And he said, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Glorious, something that is filled with glory, something that, that is, is beyond our knowledge and understanding of how important it is. And that's the church that we are talking about. If you leave here tonight and you don't have a high estimation of the church, I will have failed in my job because I, that's what I really want us to do. Sometimes we... You know, because of situation sometimes in the church, we lose our respect for it. Or we, we lose our spirit for it or whatever. But, but regardless of what people do, the church is still the church. It's still the body of Christ, the most important institution in the world. All right, we're going to notice a couple of things here. That the church was, in fact, in the mind of God from the very beginning of time. The church that you and I are now a part of in this new age, in the year 2023, this church was in the mind of God from the beginning. And it was something that he planned for. You know, in the religious world today, there's a lot of false doctrines. We're going to get into some of them a little bit later on in the week as, because it, be, it becomes a part of, of, of the history of the church as people try to insert these doctrines into it. But one of the doctrines that is out there is the doctrine of the rapture, uh, that people believe, you know, that there's going to be certain people raised and people are going to be left here and they're going to be left here for seven years and then Jesus is coming back at the end of the seven years and he's going to set up an earthly kingdom and he's going to reign on that earthly kingdom as king. And people believe that that's exactly what's going to happen. And the reason they say this is this, and this is the reason. And that is, they say, when Jesus came the first time, he failed in establishing his kingdom. That's what they say. Those who hold to that doctrine, they claim that. He failed in establishing the kingdom the first time, and so he put the church in its place, and he's coming back to establish the kingdom some future time. But in the meantime, he put the church in there so that there would be something that would fill that spot. 
I don't believe that that is the case at all. I don't believe that that's the way God, you know, intended for it to be. I don't believe Jesus failed. Do you? I think that he, he, he accomplished his mission. In fact, on the cross, one of his statements was, it is finished. What was finished? Well, a lot of things was. His life was finished. But most importantly, the plan of God was finished when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary because he died for the church. Now, here was here's the church in God's eternal purpose. Before the foundation of the world, it was in the mind of God. We know in the beginning, Genesis, the first chapter, it says that, you know, in the beginning, uh, God created uh, the heaven and the earth. And, but, but even before all of that was created, God knew what was going to happen and what was going to take place down through time. In 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 19 and 20, But the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. We're going to talk about tonight the last days that the Bible speaks about. So in these last times or these last days, Jesus is manifested. Now you say, well, the church isn't mentioned here. We're talking about Jesus on this occasion. Let's go to the book of Ephesians in the first chapter of Ephesians, beginning with verse 22. And I want to show you that any time that you read of the church, you're talking about Christ. And any time you're talking about Christ, you're talking about the church. And he says in verse 22, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Jesus becomes the head of all things to the church. And what is that? He says, Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You know the Bible, you don't need a dictionary a lot of times to, to understand the Bible or an encyclopedia or a commentary. I mean, that's about as plain as it gets. That Christ, his body, is the church, and he is the head of it. So whenever God said, who verily, speaking of Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, the church was foreordained before the foundation of the world. That's how far back our history goes tonight, as far as the church is concerned in the mind of God. Moses predicted it when Paul, in Acts the 26th chapter, was rehearsing his conversion. He did this on two different occasions. And I believe it's Acts 16 and, and here in Acts the 26th chapter. And, and here he's rehearsing what happened and how he was converted to Christianity. And he says, having therefore obtained help of God, and Paul did, he obtained that help of God. God selected him, chose him, and he would be, of course, the preacher unto the Gentiles. He says, I continue on to this day, witnessing both to the small and the great saying none of the things that those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. So what Paul preached, he went back into the Old Testament, which he was a scholar of because he had excelled in his father's religion, he said one time. So that tells me he's pretty smart regarding the law. He's pretty smart regarding what Moses had written and the prophets had written. And he says, he said, I don't go around telling anything else but what Moses and the prophets said that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show more light onto the people and to the Gentiles. Now what's that have to do with the church? Here's what it has to do. In those days of bygone days, especially under the law of Moses, God's salvation and his offering of any form of salvation was only to his people, the seed of Abraham. The Gentiles had no hope. You and I, if we'd lived back in that time, would have had no hope. But Paul was a product of one who would be sent onto the Gentiles, giving light onto the Gentiles. And that light is, of course, the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, the church was in the mind of God from the beginning. The church is also foreshadowed by the prophecies in the Old Testament. The prophets and the angels desire to know about this church age. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, we, we take the church for granted and we just assume, you know, that it's going to be here today and tomorrow and so forth and so on. But the people who lived before us, the people who lived prior to Jesus, as I said, there were millions of them. They looked for what you now have. 
They hoped for what you now have. We ought to be thankful that we have it. Because they, 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 they just, they, they lived their whole life in anticipation. This is what Peter said about it. He said, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. Everything that the prophets did was to this direction, to, to this time. Everything they said was for the establishment of the church. Because you have, you, you, you know, you have the prophecies there, you the very place Jesus would be born. I mean, he was prophesied to be born in Bethlehem and, and uh, you know, be born of a virgin and so forth and so on. And when those guys wrote that, they didn't even know what they were talking about. Did you ever think about that? They didn't know what they were talking about. They were told by the Holy Spirit to reveal this and they had hope for it. And the Bible says they inquired and they searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come to come to you. So they just they lived every day hoping that tomorrow will be the day this is going to come to pass. And they lived and they died, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. They all died not having received the promise, the book of Hebrews says. Not having received the promise, but they inquired diligently about it. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. The glory, the glorious church. And, and they, they knew all that, but they didn't know exactly what it was going to be because, you know, Paul said, he said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. He said that in relation to a statement that we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. Jeremiah gave a little bit. Ezekiel gave a little snippet of what was to come. Daniel gave a little snippet. We're going to talk about some of the things that Daniel said, the things that was to come, but they never knew what you now know. Brothers and sisters, I'm asking you, don't take this thing for granted. The church, which was in the mind of these prophets, and they desired and they searched diligently to know something about it, and now we know I like this next verse. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things. The prophets did minister to us, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel, because Peter, James, and John, and all those who were not to preach the gospel reported what these men had said. And the prophecies, that's how they proved that the church was the, uh, the fullness of God and, and the fullness of Christ. He says, with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, that's how he did it. Jesus, you remember, told them, and again, we're going to get into more of this later, but Jesus told them that they didn't even have to think about what they were going to say in that hour. It would be given them in that hour. The Holy Ghost revealed all these things to the preachers, Peter and James and John and Paul. But I love this little statement here. Which things the angels desire to look into. The angels are those that surround the throne of God. We don't even know the number of them. But I guarantee you they were all created at one time. They, you know, people don't get a set of wings and become an angel when they die. No movies, you know, play big on that part. But you don't get a set of wings when you die. There are angels that have been created. And, uh, and there are many of them. The book of Revelation describes how many. He said there are 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. So they are an innumerable number of angels. And those angels work for God and they praise God. And, 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 and I just can't, can't imagine how glorious that is up there with all that great number of angels. And you know what they're doing or what they were doing, of course, even years ago? What they were doing years ago is they were desiring to look into these things. They were just wanting to know, what have you got in mind, God? What have you got in mind here? We see all this stuff going on. We see all this prophecy. We, 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 we see all the works and, and uh, you know, the building up the, and, and coming to John the Baptist and he goes out and prepares the way. What's going on here? They didn't even know. It was not in the mind of angels to know the mind of God. And so, again, I simply want you to realize how great this institution is, that the prophets look forward to that day that it would come. And the angels desired to see it to come, to see it to happen. The church would be for all the world. This was something that was new. Because salvation was only to God's people, the seed of Abraham. 
But when Isaiah wrote these words, I don't even know if Isaiah knew the fullness of them. He was told to write these words by the Holy Spirit. I don't know that he knew that all the encompassing things that is written here. He said the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it should come to pass in the last days. That is a word I want you to keep in mind because that is an important word when we're talking about the history of the church. The last days. So he said it should come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow onto it. That's the first time anybody could have possibly said that. And it was still just a prophecy, but, 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 but you know, it was unbelievable. You mean those Gentiles are going to be allowed in here? You mean those Greeks are going to be allowed in here? You mean those Arabs are going to be allowed in here? And on and on and on. You see, it had never been that way. So this was something that was new and something that was, that was breathtaking for him to be able to declare. All nations shall flow into the church. And so the church, this is what makes the church. There's no organization that is like this in all the world. No organization. Where all the world or any in the world can be a part of it. Is there? I mean, I, there may be something I'm missing here, but in the political world, there's divisions between countries and so forth and so on. And, 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 and everything else, there's all kinds of uh, hindrances and all kinds of uh, requirements and pre-requirements to be a part of something. This is open to the world. That makes the church itself a remarkable institution. All right. We are given the time frame when the church was to come into existence. In the Bible, in prophecy, we are given the time frame that it was to come into existence. It's found in Daniel, the second chapter, verses 31 through verse 45. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time right here because this has to do with my beautiful drawing over here on the board. You know, I, I know you're, you're thinking I need to keep my day job because I didn't make, won't make much of an artist. But I tried to make it as ugly as I could because that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar saw. In fact, the Bible says it was terrible. So it probably was worse than this right here. I don't know what it looked like, but it was a monster of some kind. And Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar, he had this dream found in Daniel, the first chapter, I believe it is, and, and continuing on in Daniel, the second chapter. Okay, so King Nebuchadnezzar, he was king of Babylon. And Babylon, at that point, was the number one world power in the world. Now, I, you, you and I can't imagine what that meant. Because in all of our lifetime and in all of the history of the United States, there's never been a number one world power. We think we are. And we think Russia might be, and we think China might be, but they are not. I'm talking about a kingdom, a king, that has power over all the world. In fact, the Bible said he had power over the animals and over all the creatures on the earth. He was the most powerful man that was known at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar. He had a dream. And in this dream, he saw an image, and he, and, and, but, but when he went to the Chaldeans, who were the you know, soothsayers and the, uh, and, and the dream interpreters and so forth, their life was threatened. He said, if you, can't, if you can't answer this dream, we'll cut you up into pieces. It was, it was so disturbing to see this dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar, you know, they, these men, they said, okay, we'll, we'll do this, but, you know, tell me what the dream was and we'll interpret it. He said, I don't know what it was. Now, how can you interpret a dream if you can't even remember the dream? He knew it was bad, but he could not even remember the dream. And so, you know, he, he, he got really upset. And then he came to, to, to knowledge that there was a man in his kingdom that he had taken captive whenever he destroyed Jerusalem. And, and, uh, and his name was Daniel. He was a, a, a very well-known prophet of God or man of God. And, and, uh, and, and so Daniel was there. And, and Daniel had got to where he was because he was able to interpret dreams. Remember the, I could have mixed up the, the butcher and the baker or candlestick maker or something like that. But, you know, he, he interpreted the dreams of these two guys that was in prison. And they remembered that. And so they called Daniel forward. And that's where we go to Daniel, the second chapter, to kind of get that picture. 
Daniel comes, and lo and behold, he, he, he not only can interpret the dream, he can tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was. That would be pretty powerful. And he told the King Nebuchadnezzar what he saw. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, he said, you saw in your dream an image, and he called it terrible. But it had the parts of a, of a human body. It had a head, it had hands, it had thighs, it had feet. And, 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 he, and what made it even more terrible that each one of the parts of this body was of different elements. The head was gold, the shoulders up here and so forth, and the arms were silver, the, the thighs were brass, and the feet down here were iron and clay. So here's this, this image. And he begins to describe what the image represented. The image's head was of fine gold. This is Daniel 2, 32. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, and his belly and his thighs of brass, and his legs of iron, his feet a part of iron and a part of clay. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, you saw that beast until you saw a stone that was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that stone rolled and hit this image, hit this monster, and broke it into all kinds of pieces. That's what he says. He says, Thou sawest till that stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet. Now that's important to remember that the stone smote him on his feet because that's when things begin to change. Not the head, not the belly and the thighs, but his feet. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together. It became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I love that little phrase. This stone became a mountain and it filled the whole earth. Do you remember the passage that I mentioned a little bit ago? And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. The term mountain in prophecy always referred to a government or a governing body. In Revelation it does so. You know, the mountains, the, 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 the seven mountain city, Rome, and so forth. So you've got, you've got this mountain, which in, in prophetical language refers to, to uh, 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 countries or nations. And so he says, the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and he shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow onto it. So whenever I read this statement here, it just kind of seems to me to be, to, to put it all together. This image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Something that all these other kingdoms could not do. Now, let's go back to Daniel, the second chapter there. That's, that was the, the, the dream. That's all he's doing here. He said, this is what you saw. And Nebuchadnezzar did not argue and say, no, I didn't. He knew that's exactly what he saw. He, it was brought back to his memory again. So he says, this is the dream. And we will tell you the interpretation thereof before the king. So he commences to tell the story of the dream, what it meant. And this is the story. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. Even Nebuchadnezzar, you know, in Daniel, I don't know, it's about the seventh chapter or so, it says that God sets up in the kingdoms of man whomsoever he will. And so whatever powers there are, whatever kingdoms there are, you know, God has set it up. So he says, God has given you, he has made you a king of kings. He made you, he give you all the glory and, and everything that you now have. And he said, wheresoever the children of men dwell, wheresoever they dwell, and the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air hath he given unto thine hand, and thou hast made thee, uh, or he has made thee a great ruler over them all. So he's talking to King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He said, he has made you the ruler over them all. He says, thou art the head of gold. You don't need a 
commentary to understand that, do you? Because he told them exactly. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, in that dream, you're represented by that head right up there. You are the head of gold. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now, how do you, if, you, if you're the number one man and you're the most powerful nation in the world, how do you ever get defeated? Well, with God, all things are possible, I guess you could say. That's about all I can say about this. Because God had a plan. And even though he was the king of kings and nobody was ever greater than him, there was another kingdom that came into play. The next kingdom that became the most powerful kingdom in the world were the Medes and the Persians. Uh, and this was during the time the Medes and the Persians were in power during the times of Nehemiah when he went back, you know, to, uh, to, to build, rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Artaxerxes was a part of that kingdom. But how did they get into power? Well, Belshazzar, there's a lot of names here, but Belshazzar, who was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, he was, he, 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 you know, when Nebuchadnezzar died, he got the kingdom. And so he was having a big party and they had taken the gold and the silver goblets that they had stolen from the temple in Jerusalem and were having a big party, a drunken party out of it. And God decided at that time, that's enough. And so he caused the, the, the Medes and the Persians, they came, Babylon, they said, was a city that was unconquerable. You could not get over its walls. Well, they didn't need walls. They came in through the sewer system. That, you know, some, that sewer has to go somewhere. <laughs> it has to run out of the city somewhere. So they came in through the solar system, and that's the story. I know you remember this story, the handwriting on the wall. Old Belshazzar sitting there, and he sees this hand up there writing on the wall, and it says, uh, well, I forget what it says. <laughs> but, but you know what it said. It simply meant uh, that your time is limited, and your time has come to an end. And he was very afraid. And, of course, the Medes and the Persians showed up. They take the power. They become ruler. And we actually have, I mean, this is a fact of history I'm talking about. We actually have dates from 607 to 539. Now, you know, back in the Old Testament, it goes down. And when we come to Christ, it goes back up again. So you've got the year 607 to 539. That's how long Nebuchadnezzar ruled. And then the Medes and Persians took over, 534. Listen to what he says. After thee shall arise another kingdom in fear to thee, another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So the Medes and the Persians were silver. The next part of the beast was brass, and it was the Grecians. Now I know you know this, because this is one of the things we all were taught in school. You've heard of uh, Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was one of the main kings of the Greeks. In fact, Alexander the Great died at a very young age, and if he'd have lived a, a, a lot longer, he would have accomplished a great deal. Because, you know, he, his idea was in knowledge, and he built libraries down in Alexandria. He built a whole city down in Egypt called Alexandria, and, and it, it, he was just a fabulous individual, but he died a very young man. But he was a part of that and, and that's what he's talking about here when he refers to the brass. The brass came in, they conquered the Medes and the Persians uh, through men like Alexander the Great. And then finally, in 146, there was a change that came. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in peace and bruise. Whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with mire clay. That's important to understand what kingdom we're talking about here. The kingdom we are talking about is, and, 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 and the fact of history is, the Romans overcame the Grecians in the year 146 BC. So 146 years before Christ, the Roman Empire became a power. It lasted for, for many years till 476 AD, and that's when the Roman Empire collapsed. But during this period of time, you know, Rome, the Roman Empire started in Rome, but it wasn't long till the Roman Empire divided. There was an Eastern Empire, there was a Western Empire. 
The Western Empire held its capital at Rome. The Eastern Empire held its capital at Constantinople. Constantine, who I talked to you about just last night. Constantine was the originator of that Eastern Empire. So this is what he's talking about here. He said that's the reason it's iron and clay because the, 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 empire, the, 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 the kingdom there would be divided. And he says, whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, for they shall not cleave one to the other, even as iron cannot be mixed with clay. And the Roman Empire did that very thing. They mix themselves with all of humanity. As they conquer the world, they, you know, they, they begin to intermarry in that world and they mix themselves with all these various powers. And in the days of these kings, here we get now down to, I, I've spent all this time to get to this one verse. In the days of these kings, what kings? The kings that we're now at. In the days of the Romans right here, here's what's going to happen. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. I just love, I just love that passage. Because in the days of the Romans, God was going to set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. And it would encompass and it would envelop all of the other kingdoms. You know, there's a lot of talk. I know at least in my growing up, of a world system, a one world system. You hear that, of course, by a lot of radio preachers, a, a world system where one group of people or one person is going to rule the world. I can set you at ease tonight. That's never going to happen. I don't care how powerful you think China's going to get or Russia's going to get or whatever. That's never going to happen. Why? Because God gave you the plan right here. He told you how many powers, supreme powers there would be. There are only four of them is all there ever be. Because in the days of these kings, the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. That's just, to me, it's just beautiful. I hope it is to you. And so this, this church that we are talking about, is this house of the Lord that was established in the top of the mountains above all other kingdoms and would be entered into by all other kingdoms. That's the church that we have that we glorify today. When was the church started? Well, we know for a fact that it was started in the last days because that's what it said in Isaiah, the second chapter. In the last days, the God of heaven will set up this kingdom. In Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. The last days are the period of time in which we now live. And I know you've seen, I'm kind of running out of board here, but I know you've seen this little, this little uh, uh, analogy, the three humps here. And uh, the first one is the beginning of time down here. And you have, of course, a period of time in your Bible. There's three distinct periods of time. You have in your Bible uh, the, what we call the patriarchal age. And, and this is a period of time where the people were ruled by the patriarchs, by the fathers, the fathers of, of the people. There's uh, uh, many of them that stand out of the Bible, Abraham, you know, and Noah, and and, and Enoch and, and all those uh, people that you read about over there. And this one here lasted for about 2,500 years. You have, of course, the mosaical that lasted for 2,500 years. So at the end of this period, you have a man comes into play by the name of Moses. And he begins then through this element to establish that 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 people that was after the seed of Abraham and the Mosaical law was given. That back here, God was the law. Here under the Mosaical time, the 10 tablets or the 10 commandments that were written on those two tablets became the law. And of course, the Levitical, the book of Leviticus describes the explanation of all those laws. And so that there was, a, you know, just 10, but, but they of course had a lot of meaning to them. And then at the end of this period, there was, of course, the Christ at the end of the Mosaical Age. We now are living 223 plus years, depending on where you want to put the, the, the beginning part of it. But in this particular era, we are calling it the Christian Age. 
And what, when the Bible says that Jesus hath in these last days, or God hath in these last days spoken unto us through his Son, it is these days right here. It's the last of the period of time that we have. And as I said, this is, a, again, a, another wonderful thing. In Acts, the second chapter, he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So they go back again to the Old Testament, to Joel, the prophet. He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days that God will pour out his spirit upon all men. Well, he did that, didn't he? He did that in the book of, of Acts. He poured out his spirit onto those apostles who would go on to the world and preach the gospel. But in Acts the 10th chapter, he poured out his spirit on the Gentiles through Cornelius. And the beginning of that was, of course, allowing Cornelius and the Gentiles to be brought in so that the fulfillment of scriptures would take place, that all the world, Jews and Gentiles, could be a part of this great institution. The word of the Lord, he said, will go forth from Jerusalem. I want you to notice that passage. Because we now know just exactly where the church is going to begin. It's going to begin in Jerusalem. Now, if Jesus is, and, 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 and God's will is made known through Jesus in these last days, when is he going to start that will to be known? According to Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born, he said that many, he said it should come to pass in the last day that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established at the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion goat shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Keep that in mind because that's very important. That gives you a place. We've talked about the time now. We've talked about the time here of the Romans in the days of these kings. Something's going to happen. Now he is telling us there's an actual place that is going to happen. All right. The apostles were told in Acts, the first chapter, and this is parallel to Mark 16, Matthew 28, Luke 24, which is the same time zone where Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives and he's giving his final instructions to the apostles. Now, each one of those men have a different way of, of expressing it, such as, you know, Mark says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Matthew says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And Luke 24 words in another way. But the same account is found in Acts 1, where Jesus is with his disciples on the, uh, on, on the, uh, there on that uh, mountaintop. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So why would you even why would you even say that? I mean, he's going to go to heaven here in just a few minutes. There's certainly a lot of things he would want to tell his disciples. He'd been with them for three years, and he's about to ascend right out of their sight in the clouds and be taken up into heaven. And the first thing out of his mouth is, you stay in Jerusalem. Do not depart from this city. He says, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, what, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They still did not understand the nature of the kingdom, did they? They thought that he was going to come and set up on an earthly throne. They didn't understand that the nature of the kingdom is spiritual. That it would be through the church that this kingdom, of course, would rule throughout the whole world. And he said, it is, not, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons for which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost will come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. They were to preach the gospel beginning at Jerusalem. Listen to Luke's account of that very day. He says, and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoove Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. So the prophet said, the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem. Jesus says, don't depart from Jerusalem. He tells them here that, that this message 
of the nature of Jesus and his purpose in this world would begin at Jerusalem. I believe the fulfillment of this promise with everything that was said about the Holy Ghost being poured out upon them is found in Acts, the second chapter, one of the most important days. It was the birthday of the church in the world. It was the beginning of the building of that house that would be established at the top of the mountains and all of the world would follow into it. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they all with one accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And Peter went out of that assembly that day, and there were thousands and thousands of people that had come to Jerusalem for a special feast, the Feast of Pentecost. Peter opens his mouth, and he didn't even have to think what he was going to talk about because the Holy Spirit gave him that message that day. And those people on that day who heard that message, the Bible says in Acts, the second chapter, this same chapter, they that gladly heard the word were baptized. And there was added to the church 3,000 souls. Actually, it says this. It was added unto them, 3,000 souls. Who was the them? Would it not have been the 12 that was in that room that had been overpowered by the Holy Spirit? That was the nucleus. That was the foundation of the church, of which Peter would later on say, Jesus Christ was its chief cornerstone. I just, I, I, I can't tell you how much it thrills me to tell you all that. Because you see, we have evidence for the church of Christ. We have evidence. We have a time frame. We have a, a city that it's going to start in, in Jerusalem. We have the actual uh, uh, description of what's going to take place. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And here it is. It's happening right here before our eyes. In the latter part of the days of Christ, he declared, I will build my church. That's what he's doing here. He's building the church. And he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I, I, I consider that passage, and here's the way I look at it. The gates of hell will not keep it from being built and will not ever destroy it. You know why? Because of what Daniel said back there. A kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And so though, as we talked about last night, the church was in, in the wilderness or in hiding for several years when there were great persecutions and so forth, it was kept alive somehow. In Acts, the second chapter, the church is now in existence, praising God and having all the favor with the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the church and the kingdom, I believe, are one and the same thing. I'm going to just, I'm almost done. I told you we'd cut it off. And not keep you too long, but I'm almost done here. I just want to go on in a few more slides. Uh, uh, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. And I, I put this in here because, you know, once again, there are people who are saying that the kingdom never did come. That the kingdom is going to come in the future. Jesus is going to come and, 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 and establish a kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. Well, what was it that Peter got the keys to? To Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. If you're given the keys, if, if, if you say, I'm going to give you the keys to that Mercedes Benz out there, there better be a Mercedes Benz out there for me to get into. You know, what purpose would it be for a keys if there wasn't any Mercedes Benz? What purpose would there be for a church if there was no keys? What purpose would it be for the keys if there's no church? And so Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. And he said, I will give thee the keys of the kingdom. And this was in the same breath that he talked about this that this church, what sort of thou shalt find on earth, shall be found in heaven. The kingdom, we are told in another place, Mark 9 and 1. And he says unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Folks, if the kingdom isn't here, there's a lot of old people out there somewhere. Because Jesus said, there will be some of you standing here that you are standing here will not taste of death until you see this kingdom come. So I know it came, and it came when that Holy Spirit came. It came when Peter preached the gospel, and that kingdom was established. Power was to come with the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power after the, the, that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
And again, as I said, that he said it would come with power. And this is when that power came, when the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, the kingdom was established on Pentecost. Pentecost marks the beginning. In Acts the 11th chapter, you know, Peter went down there to uh, uh, Cornelius. And uh, this was a no-no as far as the Jews were concerned because they did not have fellowship with Gentiles. And Peter went down there and he even baptized them. I tell you, that was, a, that was quite a step to baptize a Gentile. That was a terrible thing. And, and, and so when he came back to Jerusalem, he had to, he had to give an answer for his actions. He had to tell the brethren there why he did what he did. And we know the story how that, you know, God proved to him through the, 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 the sheet, you know, on top of the roof with the unclean animals. And Peter began to realize, he put two and two together, that with God nothing is unclean, that all could be able to have the hope of everlasting life. And when, when Peter was explaining this to those brethren in Acts 11, he said, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. So I know this is the beginning because Peter called it the beginning. The beginning of the church, the day of Pentecost. This was that that Joel spoke about, you see, when he said that the Spirit of God will be poured upon all men. Now it was not only on the Jews, but it had been poured out upon the Gentiles in this very special uh, situation. Uh, just for your comfort, this is the last slide. Okay? So Daniel... The seventh chapter, I want to close with that because Daniel, the seventh chapter, just holds out so many important things about this situation. Now, you know, Daniel was an interpreter of dreams. He interpreted a lot of people's dreams. But one time, Daniel himself had a dream. He had a dream. He said in verse 13 of Daniel 7, I saw in the night visions... And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now, words are pictures, brothers and sisters, and I want you to picture this. Daniel in his dream saw a man who looked like the Son of Man. And he said, I saw that Son of Man come in the clouds. So he's up there in the clouds riding along. He said, I saw him and he came to the ancient of days. Now, Daniel in his dream is not looking at it from earth's perspective. He's looking at it as if he's standing in heaven himself. Because the ancient of days is God. He is as old as days are. And that is, the word ancient is spelled with a capital A, which doesn't mean anything really, but, but the term ancient of days is God. So this one, Daniel sees him. He says, I saw him come in the clouds, and they brought him before the ancient of days. So here is God, and here is this one like unto the Son of Man. And here's what happened. And there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that was given to this one who was like on the same man, glory, dominion and a kingdom that all people the whole world all nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Isn't that beautiful? I know when the kingdom came into power. I know when it was started here on this earth. But it actually got its coronation in heaven. A kingdom was given to Jesus. He was that son of man. Now, Daniel saw the dream from heaven looking down and I have a verse down here in Acts, the first chapter, verses 9 through 10. This is when Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. Remember? And he's told his disciples to go into all the world, preach the gospel. He says, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. But the point I'm trying to make is here, 
that those men on that mountain saw Jesus get on a cloud and Daniel saw him land in Daniel the seventh chapter saw him land when he got off that cloud he came before God and God said the kingdom is yours the kingdom that you died for is yours and you are king of kings I, I, I said this was the last slide I lied I'll, I'll probably be the first one on the on the on the repent list tonight. <laughs> the kingdom will end someday. You see, you see, the kingdom's in existence right now. It's not something that's going to come and last for a thousand years. It's here. It is the church. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26, Paul talking about the end of time, he says, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. So God gave him the kingdom way back there. Before it was started here on the day of Pentecost, he gave him the kingdom. Jesus has had control of it all this time. Now, he says he's going to give it back to God. When's that going to happen? When he shall have put down all rule and authority and power. For he must reign. There's your reign right there. Jesus is reigning now. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So, brothers and sisters, when you see the, the hearse going down the road, you know the kingdom's still here. Because that's exactly what he said. He said the last enemy he's going to destroy is death. And it hasn't been destroyed yet. Death still is, is, is the monster that we all face at some point in our life. And it's still around. So the kingdom will be in existence till that is gone. And when that is gone, of course, then time on this earth is no more. And we shall be able to enjoy the glories of heaven. Well, let's see if there's one more slide. I think that's it, really. No, there's one more. <laughs> In Jeremiah 31, this is exactly what God through Jeremiah had prophesied. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers the day that I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law into the inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. In other words, this law is not going to be in some two tablets of stone. This law is going to be in the heart of my people. And he says here, and they shall teach no man more than more his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. And the world does know our God. From the least of them to the greatest of them, say the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity. And I will remember their sin no more. Oh, what a, what a rejoicing that must have been when they heard that from Jeremiah. I'll remember their sin no more. That is a, a lot of things to take in tonight. But with all this prophecy and all these things, that like, like a puzzle being put together, I think you could say with me tonight, the church, the kingdom of Christ is a most glorious thing. It's here, it was planted, and it's up to us to continue it on. That's why, that's why tomorrow, this is gonna to be our topic. The New Testament authorizes three works for the church. And we, if we're gonna keep this kingdom alive, have to continue in those three works. Well, tonight we never know the minds of those who are present. We want to offer an invitation to you if you're hearing the sound of our voice, you'd like to become a member.